Here's some hints to get you jump started on the proof of the open set characterization of continuous function. So what we're trying to do is show that if we have a function that we know satisfies the definition of continuity based on the limit definition at all points of its domain, then any time we have an interior point of a set u, its pre-image, so any point x that satisfies f of x is equal to y, will be an interior point of the inverse image of u. This is the key ingredient in proving that continuous functions have the property that the inverse image of open sets are always open sets. So how we might approach this? Let's think about what it would look like to pick the set u. I'm going to pick it as though it's kind of a subset of the y-axis on this graph, because I'm thinking of them as images of points from this function. Here's my continuous function, y equals f of x. That continuity hypothesis is going to be really important in your proof. And so then what does the inverse image of u look like? It's just that segment of the x-axis whose x values have their y values in u, according to the graph. So it's this purple shaded segment here. So what we're trying to do is show that if I pick a point which is an interior point of u, and if x is a point that satisfies f of x is equal to y, then what we need to show is that x is an interior point of the inverse image of u, f inverse of u. So this is really going to be an exercise in unpacking two, dif two different definitions, the definition of interior point and the limit definition for a continuous function, and figuring out how they all fit together in the proof. So starting with the definition of interior point, remember these are what we called in class the points that have breathing room within their respective sets. So if y is an interior point of u, that means that there exists some positive number c such that the open interval of radius c around y is entirely a subset of u. In other words, y can stretch out its arms, each of which is a length of c, and everywhere that its arms are uh, is an element of the set u. So this interval lies completely within u. So that's what it means for y to be an interior point of u, and this is something that we get to assume to be true as part of our proof. So in other words, this c we get for free just by assuming that y is an interior point of view, and that gets the ball rolling. So we'll say in our proof, because y is an interior point of view, there exists a c greater than zero, such that the interval, open interval, y minus c to y plus c, is completely a subset of u. Okay, but now how, we ask, are we going to turn this information into some information about whether x has breathing room within this purple set down here? So how does knowing that y has breathing room tell us that its preimage x has breathing room. And the key ingredient there is the continuity of the function f that relates x to y. And that continuity comes to us here in the form of the limit definition. So we'll say because f is a continuous function, for all epsilons greater than zero, we can find a delta greater than zero, such that any x which is within delta of x naught, so actually I'm going to relabel this point down here. I'm not going to call it x anymore. Let me call it x naught and f of x naught is equal to y, we want to show x naught as an interior point. So we want to show that any x which is within a delta's reach of x naught will automatically have its y value within an epsilon's reach of, uh, it's, sorry, it's, its f of x value will be within an epsilon's reach of y. And in our picture, what that means uh, is that we want to show in order to show that x is an interior point, we want to show that it, x0, can stretch out its arms inside the purple set. And so there, we need to show there exists a c prime greater than 0, that's the length of its arms that it can stretch out here, such that the open interval x0 minus c prime, x0 plus c prime is completely contained within the purple set, the inverse image of u. So to finish our picture here, what we might think about is how these various parameters relate one to another. So we got the c, the amount of breathing room that y has within its set, we got that for free from the definition. Right? And so what we can do is look at what is the inverse image of this open interval, y minus c to y plus c. That's this interval I shaded down here in brown. And the question is, why does x0 have breathing room within that interval? If x0 has breathing room within that interval, then that will imply, and you can show why, that it has breathing room inside of the whole purple set. So why does x0 have breathing room? How far can it stretch out its arms? Well, the definition of continuity, it turns out, is actually going to tell us why x has breathing room, uh, x0 has breathing room within the purple set. Because the amount by which x0 stretches out its arms, we call c prime here, may be related in some way to the delta 
which is supplied to us by the continuity, the limit definition of continuity. So the main idea here is to figure out how to construct this C prime as the result of the delta that gets spit out from the definition of continuity. But in order to spit out a delta, we need to supply this definition with an epsilon. So where is the epsilon going to come from in the definition of continuity? And the key ingredient here that links these two together, and this one I'm going to give you um, just for free as a thank you for watching this hint, is that the epsilon that is obtained that we can plug into our definition of continuity can be exactly that C which was given to us as the amount of breathing room that the interior point Y has within the set U. In other words, the function, the purpose of epsilon in the limit definition of continuity is the same purpose that C has in this picture showing us how much breathing room that Y has within this set. So if we take the epsilon from our limit definition to actually be the C that we obtained, then the definition of continuity is going to tell us that there exists a delta such that absolute value of x minus x naught is less than delta implies absolute value of f of x minus y is less than, and now this wouldn't be epsilon anymore, this would be, once again, c. See if that gives you enough of these pieces to put together to get you started on the proof of this for group assignment number 10.